all right, my friends. Well, wasn't worship awesome today? I loved it. So much fun. But hey, today we're going to be continuing in the book of Mark, and we're going to finish up with chapter 2, which is pretty exciting. But before we go into that, I want to share a little bit about myself. And what I want you guys to know, it's not a secret. If you know me well, you know this. But I love Chinese food. I love Chinese food, y'all. I mean, literally, Danny and I, we, it's like, we know we found the, the Chinese buffet here, you know, in the area. We love to go eat our Chinese food, but I love it. And here's the thing, growing up, that was kind of a part of my life. And I knew that when I would go to my grandparents' house, we were definitely going to have Chinese food. I mean, my grandfather, y'all, it's a little bit of chicken, a little bit of rice, a little bit of lo mein, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. Soy sauce, you know, like, I knew that we were going to have Chinese food. And then growing up, it was a tradition where every Sunday after church, we went to the Chinese food restaurant, and we had Chinese Like, I love Chinese food, y'all. But here's the thing. When I was a kid, and I started kind of getting a little adventurous, what, what would I do? I would have the stuff on my plate, and then I would say, it needs a little bit of something. It needs soy sauce. And literally, I would take the soy sauce, and I would just start pouring it and pouring it. And pouring it, and my mom's like, you better stop. I would just start pouring it. And then I would eat it, and I would ruin the whole meal. Why? Because it's too salty. Too salty. I would ruin it. But you know what? Today, with what we're actually going to be taking a look at, we're going to see that the Pharisees could be spokespeople for Kikomon. They could be spokespeople. But here's the thing. Their sauce was just a little different. And what I mean by that is that their sauce, it was so strong, and they would try to put it on everyone. They would try to make everyone follow, you know, this sauce, these rules that they had created, and they made life a lot more difficult because of their special sauce. It was a lot more salty. And whenever you think about that, and you think about the fact that our you know, they're doing this and their sauce is super salty and they're trying to get people to abide by these rules that they have put in place. It made life so difficult that people didn't have fun anymore. And it became a legalistic religion, just like what we talked about last week. But the question, I have a few questions for you guys, and some of those questions for you all is, are we sometimes guilty with trying to put a little bit of sauce on people. So I have five questions for you guys. And I want you guys to kind of tally this up in your brain as to if you think that you may fit along one of these things. You ready? Here we go. Number one, does it come easy to me to look for the shortcomings in others and rarely address my own shortcomings? Number two, am I more critical towards people than I am encouraging? Number three, have I ever fished for a spiritual compliment? Four, are there certain things that are beneath me because I have been a Christian for some time now? And five, am I more concerned about being seen rather than being known? Now, whenever you tally that up in your head, you're probably thinking, okay, I deal with one or more of those things, and I want to let you know that you're not alone. If you're dealing with that and you are struggling with one of those questions that I asked, you are not alone. But you're sitting here thinking, well, Tyler, how do I get past that? How do I work through that? How do I fix that? And that's a great question because today we're going to take a look at that. And I have three things for you all that we can be working on so that that special sauce is not causing people to run from God, but to run towards God. So the first thing that I have for you guys today is, one, don't let man-made rules hold you hostage. Don't let man-made rules hold you hostage. Now, you're probably thinking, well, what exactly are you talking about? Well, I have a story. So I went to a private 
Christian University. And my freshman year, I was super excited to move on campus because I was thinking, you know, I'm going to go to this university. It's going to be so much fun. I have a full scholarship to this university. It's going to be a blast. It's going to be awesome. And I get there, and you go into your dorm, which looks like a prison because it's just concrete block walls everywhere, painted gray. But you're inside this dorm room, and then all of a sudden you have this meeting with your RA. And the RA is going to share with you all of the rules that you have to follow while you're at school. And I know they expect you to read the handbook, but you know I didn't read that handbook. Good night. It was thick. And I'm like, there's no way. So they're going to go through all those rules with you anyways. And they sit down with you and they tell you, hey, here are the rules that we have set for you. One of the first rules that they wanted to share with me was curfew is 10 p.m. in your dorm. I'm thinking, I'm sorry? Like, that wasn't even my curfew when I was in high school, 10 p.m. And they're like, yeah, you got to be in your dorm at 10 p.m. Now, the only way that you can not be in your dorm is if you have a pass from the computer lab, which that kind of shows my age that you have to go to the computer lab. Uh, but you have, you have a pass at the computer lab, and if you didn't have that pass, then you would get points. And at the end of the year, those points would add up, and then you would have to pay a fine. Or if you were, at, if you were off campus in the evening, the only way you could do so is if you were at your parents' house. And I'm like, well, my parents live eight hours away, so that's not going to happen. So I'm stuck here at 10. And literally, 10 o'clock, knock, knock, knock. We want to make sure you're all in here, OK? Rules like that. Crazy, insane. They also had rules like, hey, if you're going to class, you have to wear a collared shirt or a button down, and you, have, you can wear jeans. That was new, that you could wear jeans. Brand, that was a brand new rule, because it used to be you had to wear khakis and a button-down shirt. So I was like, ooh, I get to wear jeans to class. But that was another rule. Then they said, you could wear a hoodie, but if you have a shirt on under your hoodie, you can't take the hoodie off. Okay. Guys, no sandals. Oh, and guys, your hair can't touch your ears. And if you want to get your hair colored, you have to get it approved. I'm like, Lord, have mercy. Like, all these rules, for what reason? What good was that going to do with my, I mean, like, is that going to change my education if I wear flip-flops to class? No, of course not. But they had all these man-made rules that eventually made you feel trapped. And it made you feel like you really couldn't do very much of anything. But hey, I thought I was cool because I could wear jeans to class. Looking back on that now, it's like, holy cow. Now, those rules have changed over time, but yet those rules were there to keep you feeling restricted. And so today, we're going to take a look at a moment in time in Scripture where some rules were so ridiculous that it choked the life of people who wanted to follow God. So if you would, go on ahead and open up your Bibles to the book of Mark, and we're going to take a look at chapter 2. We're going to, like I said, we're going to finish off chapter 2, and we're going to start off in verse 23 and 24. And we're going to just take a look at what happens in Mark chapter 2. So here we go. Verse 23, it says, One Sabbath, he was going through the grain fields, and as they made their way, his disciples began to pluck heads of grain. Verse 24, and it says, And the Pharisees were saying to him, Look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? Now, here, let me give you a little context here. It was okay to pluck grain on someone's field if you knew them. That was not against the law. It was totally okay if I was to go to Aaron's field and pluck some grain from it. Aaron should be like, there you go. You got your grain. That would be okay. Nothing was wrong with that. So know that they were not doing anything against the law. However, the Pharisees were so upset. Why? Because they did this on the Sabbath. They literally plucked some grain, and the Pharisees were mad because it was on 
the Sabbath, y'all. Doesn't that just sound insane to you? That they're so mad because they did it on a specific day? But they did, and because they did, it caused a lot of issues. And it's easy for them to see the shortcomings of others around them, but not being able to see their own shortcomings. And I wanted to give you guys a couple of examples of, of some maybe things that we might think it's easy for us to look at and kind of place on others. And whenever you hear it out loud, you're thinking, that's a little ridiculous, but it's honestly kind of true. And those, a couple of those things are a gossiping problem. Maybe it's an anger problem. Maybe it's a workaholic problem. And we like to look at other people and tear them down whenever, honestly, we might have some of those problems ourselves. And that's happening in Scripture where we see that they have all of these rules and honestly, uh, the, the... Whenever you take a look at Scripture and you take a look at what God's Word is for us, we can see that on the Sabbath, which is found in Exodus chapter 20 and Nehemiah chapter 9, that, hey, these, these rules, they're in the basic form, they're really not that bad. And if you want to see those rules, you can see them in Deuteronomy chapter 23 and 24 and know that, hey, in the basic form, we can all abide by these rules. However, the Pharisees had their little secret sauce, their extra sauce. And what would happen was the Pharisees added 39 more rules to God's law, and they were all man-made. They were rules that they thought, well, my great-granddaddy believed in this, and he thought that this was good, and this is what we're supposed to do. And so I'm going to you know, keep putting these and adding these rules, and they got up to these 39 additional rules. And I wanted to share with you guys one of them. You ready? You can't walk more than 1,999 paces on the Sabbath. Y'all, we have Apple Watches and Fitbits and Google Watches and all that kind of stuff. And we're like, I need to get my 10,000 steps. Not on the Sabbath, uh-uh. Nope, if you walk more than 1,000, who is counting 1,999 paces I mean, it's almost as if you're not supposed to work on the Sabbath, but yet these Pharisees were working on the Sabbath to make sure that you weren't doing these things. Hello, how ignorant is that? 1,999 paces. Use your brain. Come on, y'all. That's insane. But what happened was this was the start of their religion instead of a relationship with God. This was the start of all these rules that you ha had to abide by rather than really focusing on worshiping God vertically instead of all these horizontal, man-made rules. So what are some of those man-made rules that we may face in today's society? Well, one of those rules might be, you've been told, hey, you can't serve God unless you're in full-time ministry. And I'm here to tell you that is nowhere in the Bible. Nowhere in the Bible, y'all. And whenever we actually take a look at what's in the Bible, here's, I'm going to tell you something. Paul was actually a tent maker by trade as he was serving Jesus. And we have people across the lobby that's in our kids' area serving our kids right now. And guess what? They have so much joy watching your kids and my kids sing and praise God. Nowhere in the Bible does it say you have to be in full-time ministry to serve Him. That's ridiculous. Another one? I grew up with this one. Sunday's best only. You had to wear your Sunday's best Women had to wear their dresses down to their ankles, and you had to wear the hat that's on top of your head with the massive flower, so the person behind you had to be going like this to see the worship pastor, you know? Then you had to have, the, the men had to wear suits with the tie. Y'all, I remember when I was a kid, 
And there was a church that my, my dad was the worship pastor at, and it was a privilege to have July because it was no tie July. Do you know what the Bible actually says? Scripture prescribes modesty and clothing ourselves in purity. That's it. That's what Scripture tells us. And you know what's sad? Is that some churches, if someone's walking to church and they're not wearing their Sunday's best, People start to gossip. Church became an unsafe place. Isn't that insane? Where you're supposed to walk in and feel safe and feel loved because you're not wearing your Sunday's best. People didn't feel safe. Another one? Is maybe... You were told that you're too young, or you're too old, or you're a single mom, and you can't serve God. And I'm here to tell you right now that God doesn't use people like that. The people that are telling you those lies, God's not going to use them. If you're young, if you're old, if you're a single parent, or whatever it is in your life that you're in, God will use you, each and every one of you. And know that those man-made rules are ridiculous, and they're just tearing you down, and taking that joy that's in your life and stripping it away. That's insane to think about that. There is now... And therefore, no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. And that brings me to the second thing that we can, you know, look at. And that second thing is, don't let church become a burden. It's a blessing. Church should be a blessing. And, you know, what's happened is the Pharisees thought that Jesus was, you know, going against the law and he was doing something wrong. And they were trying to make life a burden on them. And what's funny is the question that they asked, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? Jesus' response is awesome. Let's take a look uh, at a little piece of verse 25 where he says, Have you never read what David did? Have you never read what David did? Y'all, whenever he said that, Here's what's happening. He's talking to the Pharisees and he's saying, listen, you guys are supposed to be these like Old Testament scholars. You know all of your stuff. You're supposed to be, you know, these people who know your facts and know what's going on and know what happened in the past. And yet you're totally ignoring what's happened. Jesus's point was very, very clear. And what he was trying to do was he was trying to say that, hey, what happened in Scripture you should be applying to your life today and not just saying all these random facts to make yourself look and sound good. Let me give you an example. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 12, it says, be exceedingly glad. Be exceedingly glad. And so the thing is, whenever we hear that passage of Scripture, in our lives today, what happens? Well, we're depressed, we're sad, we're always feeling down upon ourselves and we're, you know, making ourselves feel like we're not worthy of things. And yet you might be saying, well, Tyler, you have no clue as to what I'm dealing with right now in my life. And yes, you're right. But you know what I do know is that Jesus Christ died on the cross, was buried, and three days later rose from the grave. And so we should be exceedingly glad because that happened. We should know that God is right here with us and that he truly, truly loves us. Another thing that we can do to allow for ourselves to practice this is in 1 Thessalonians 5.14 and in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 24, it says, Be patient to all men. Why are we so quick-tempered? Or why is it that with our kids, the moment they don't do what we ask them to do the first time, we get so angry? 
Y'all, whenever I looked at that, it was like a roundhouse kick to my face. But we get so angry so quickly. Why don't we practice this? Put this into place. Or in Luke chapter 12, verse 7, it says, Even the hairs on your head are all numbered. Fear not, you are of more value than many sparrows. Why do we freak out over the little things? Why do we freak out over finances? And why do we freak out over what's happening in our jobs? Or why do we freak out over all of these different things whenever we should fear not? Because guess what? He's right here with us. He's going to walk us through that. Y'all, I've experienced that in my own life where I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, well, what are we going to do? We only have, you know, a month left until, you know, we no longer receive this paycheck. And then, boom, God says, eh, nope, I have something planned for you. I've experienced that myself. And I know that some of you in this room have experienced that yourself. What are we going to do next? We fear life to the point where we don't even want to leave our homes. But it says right here in Scripture, fear not. You're more valuable than many sparrows. You're more valuable. We need to practice being glad. We need to practice with our patience. And we need to practice fearing not. So let's continue taking a look at Scripture. Now let's go back to verse 25, and let's take a look at 25 and 26. And it says, And he said to them, Have you never read what, da what David did when he was in need and was hungry, and those who were with him? Verse 26, And he entered the house of God in the time of Abiathar the high priest, and ate the bread of the presence, which is not lawful for any but the priests to eat, and also gave it to those who were with him. So, let me give you a little backstory as to what specifically he's talking about. He's talking about 1 Samuel chapter 21. And in this story, what we're seeing is that Saul was hunting David down. And David is running from Saul. Why? Because David's becoming super popular. Saul's feeling like, hey, he's taking over things and people are starting to like him. They're not, you know, liking my authority. And so as David is running, what happens whenever you're doing anything in life? You get hungry, right? So David runs into the tabernacle and there is this gold table and the gold table is right in front of the Holy of Holies. And on that gold table is this bread. And the bread is, uh, it's like the top shelf best bread that you can possibly get. I mean, it's made, it's supposed to be there for God. And whenever he comes down and he is uh, just talking with his people. And yet David walks in there, and what happens is the priest gives David this bread, and, he, and him and his people, they start eating this bread, and that's considered to be unlawful. And so what we actually learn from this story is that God is more concerned with meeting the needs of people than he is with protecting some religious tradition. God is more concerned with his people and he's more concerned with allowing David to have this bread than he is this law that holds back his people. And Jesus is trying to share with the Pharisees and say, hey, what about David? You know what happened. You know the story. Why are you so concerned that we plucked some grain from this field. In Matthew chapter 12, verses 6 through 7, it's a very similar version of the story where it says, I tell you something greater than the temple is here. And if you know what this means, I desire mercy. So in other words, Jesus is saying, the thing that I am after is people. I'm after people. I want to see a difference made. Wake up, 
y'all. Wake up. I'm after people. I'm not after all these little petty rules that have been made by your great granddaddy that doesn't have anything to do with Scripture. I'm after people. You can see it time after time after time in the Bible that God is after his people. And in verse 27, it says, And he said to them, The Sabbath was made for men, not man for the Sabbath. This is where the Pharisees, you know, where whenever they were pushing into Jesus in verse 24, this is where Jesus flipped it all around and was like, ha ha. The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Because here's what happened. God knows that we need rest. God knows that we need time to be able to rest and be able to fill our cup up. And that's what's happening today. We come to church, why? To be able to fill our cup up, to be able to have rest. For some people, they get so much energy and so much joy whenever they're in those rooms across the hall, pouring into the lives of the children over there. That fills up their cup and that allows for them to fill that day of rest and fill the Sabbath. And even in the old, I mean, it's, y'all, it's even back to Genesis chapter 1, where you have to have rest. And God knows that we are simple people that desire rest and that need to be able to focus on Him. But what was happening was there were all these rules and laws that were taking them away from that, and this legalistic religion was causing for people to have a burden rather than to have that relationship. What God meant for good became the overly religious situation where people were putting the extra sauce on each other. And honestly, I believe that because of that extra sauce, that's the reason why people stop coming to church. At some point in time in their life, they were feeling like all these have-tos with religion so hard and exhausting and tiring. So now I'm not coming to church to rest, but I'm coming to church and I'm becoming exhausted. I'm not going to go to church anymore. That's the complete opposite of what it's supposed to be. Church is supposed to be a blessing to you and to me. It brings me to my third thing. Don't be blind. Jesus really is God. Don't be blind. You see, the Pharisees never got that about Jesus. And what they didn't understand was that he was the real power, not them. They wanted to have the power. They wanted to be the ones with authority. But what they didn't understand was that because Jesus is God, he's the one that ultimately has the power and the authority over our lives. And we can see in verse 28 where it says, So the Son of Man is Lord, even of the Sabbath. So what it's saying there is that the Son of Man took the title Lord. And in the Greek word, that's kurios, which is a person to whom a thing belongs, an owner. So what Jesus is saying is, listen, I own everything. I own you. I own this because I am God. I am Lord, which ultimately means that I own the Sabbath. And I'm telling you that the Sabbath is supposed to be meant for a day where we are filling our cup, where we are becoming so much more, and we are drawing closer to God, and we're resting. But these Pharisees were completely doing the opposite, and it was causing these issues. And in Matthew chapter 28, verse 18, it says, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Y'all, Jesus Christ was the Lord of the Sabbath. He was in charge. He was in control. And he was trying to teach us that. And the Pharisees just didn't get it. They didn't understand it. See, Jesus rose on the Sabbath. And on the first day of the week was when it all changed with him raising from the grave. Because now 
we come on the first day of the week and worship God. The early church met and worshiped on the first day. Now today we rest in the Sabbath, but let me tell you something. The Sabbath is no longer a day. The Sabbath is Jesus Christ. Our Lord and Savior is the Sabbath. Lean into Him. Trust Him. Worship Him. Y'all, by doing that, that will allow for us to have our lives completely transformed. But we have to wake up. We've been sleeping for so long and following all these rules, and because of that, our relationship with Him has been put on the back burner. Wake up. Let's make a difference. Let's change the world. Let's wake up. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. Maybe for some of you, you haven't made the choice yet to put your life in Jesus. And you haven't made the decision to wake up. And today, you maybe feel like, I'm ready. I want to make a difference. I want to love my God and I want to practice what's in the Bible. And if that's you, then I want you to repeat this prayer after me silently to yourself. I want you to say, Dear God, I know I'm a sinner. But today I ask you to forgive me for all of my sins, Jesus. Come into my life to be my Lord, my Savior, and my forgiver. And the best way I know how I give my life to you. Thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name, amen. Keep your heads bowed, your eyes closed. If that was you today, if you made the decision today to follow God and to say, I'm in, I'm waking up, I'm ready, just raise your hand. If that was you today, just raise your hand. I see you. God, I see hands. You see hearts. So God, I pray for the people who have made the decision today to follow you. And they will desire to do so much for you. And just wake up. And we love you. And we ask these things in your name. Amen.